The intro scene, I think it's kind of a neat concept. It's just a way of animating the logo that Phil came up with for Gamma 4. And it's done with a combination of physics simulation and a animated camera. Unity actually has... I don't have an animation layout saved, so let me just grab the animation tool here. It actually has its own animation tool, which is really cool. That rhymes, which is great. So, the camera in this scene is animated using keyframes. So I can actually swoop through the, you know, show you the game view here. I can swoop through the animation, starts here, pulls out, rotates around, flies up. These are all keyframes that you can set for the camera to animate it. And it will automatically create an animation component and add an animation to this object. And your animation actually gets saved as a file in your project. So you can apply it to other objects if you want to. You can slow it down, speed it up. Uh, it's pretty cool, actually. Um, it may be reusable in a lot of different situations. And the blocks falling down are done with physics. Uh, in the scene, they're put in their final position. And then there's a script that warps them into the sky, gives them physics objects or physics components, rather, and then lets them drop straight down. It also constrains their movement so that they don't move left or right. And that's not really too hard of a script to write. All it has to do is basically uh, clamp the X and Z positions. Or X and Y, possibly, in this case. I'm not sure exactly how this scene is oriented because I haven't looked at it in a while. So that wasn't really too difficult to set up. It took a while to play around with it to ensure that it worked properly at different frame rates and the camera move looked okay and adding sound effects and stuff. Um, but it really wasn't that hard to put together quickly. Let me put that one. Quotes is a really simple scene. It just shows a random quote every time you go to it. But it cycles through an array of quotes so you can actually define your own data types as classes. So I have a quote data here that just has two strings, and strings are text data. One's called quote, and one is the author of the quote. Um, and then I make an array out of them, which is this thing. These two square brackets here define an array. And an array is basically like a list of stuff. So in the editor, I actually get to see a visual list with uh, quotes and authors and gentry. You can add more things to the list if I want to, or take things away. Um, so there's all these goofy quotes. Um, Keiko says, John Romero, Topic, Robot, Mosquito, etc. So if you want to dick around with this, you can just go ahead and change these to you know, whatever you want. Or you can remove it completely if you prefer. Um, so that's not very complicated either. Here's a fading effect that's actually handled by a screen manager object, I ended up calling it. Um, it just basically has a separate camera that renders after the main camera, and that's done by setting this depth variable here. It also has a culling mask, which basically means it'll only render things in this layer. And if you remember, we can define layers in project setting tags. So you can see I've defined a screen layer here, it's layer 30. And you can define as many custom layers as you want. And then if you create a separate camera and make it only render that layer, that was the main camera, which renders everything right now, uh, the screen fade camera only renders things in the screen layer, so we just have this big box that's black. Um, right now it's at zero transparency, we can make it Full transparency, that's actually how the fade works. We just fade this in. I'll just change those values over time. And this is set to the layer screen so that it will be drawn on this camera. And the reason for that is so that it will be drawn in front of everything. And you also have to remember to clear the depth buffer, which is what you set here. So that might be a little bit confusing, but I think if you Check out the project files and you play around with this a bit, you'll start to get the handle on how that works. Um, so we're going to jump into the actual game and 
I haven't looked at this in a while, so bear with me. I may be a little confused trying to remember how everything works. So if you remember from the beginning of the game, there was a tutorial, and that's done with these disabled groups of objects here. Um, there's a sequence, and if I activate these, you can see that... Actually, I'll separate this so it's more obvious. Let's deactivate this first. This is the game view, and if I activate one of these cameras, their depth is set to 20, which is greater than the main cameras, which is probably zero right now, which means they'll render later. So they render over top of that, and we get to see this view instead. And attached to the camera are all the things that the camera is going to be showing uh, for this little tutorial hint. So that makes it really simple to just toggle these things off and on as we move through the sequence. We see all the different hints and they all have the associated animations and text that need to be seen when they're shown underneath them. And the function that you can use to toggle things off and on like that is called set active recursively. It basically goes through everything uh, attached to this game object and toggles it off or on, whichever you prefer for a given situation. Uh, now there is an actual script that launches all this stuff called run game intro. So this is it really, it just has a message that it sends out to toggle different groups. And remember we talked about messages um, with the blurst messaging library in one of our other tutorials. And this just delays and then sets up the next one and delays and sets up the next one. And I did something special here for the delay. I can't remember why exactly, um, but there was some reason to do it this way, I think. I hope anyway. <laughs> It's not so bad. Okay. So we have the screen manager in here too that we talked about before that handles the screen fading. This automatically does a fade in at the start, I believe. Yes, it does. So if you throw this into any scene here, it'll automatically start black and fade in. You just gotta remember to fade out when you're leaving. For some reason, I needed to do, the, to do this. This was a weird hack. I had to actually explicitly enable gravity, uh, set it to a certain value. I think that might be because I have to set gravity to some weird value in the intro sequence where the blocks fall down. GUI does not do anything. This is useless. Take that out. Because this was a prototype that was created over only like a week of work. Uh, there's a bunch of things left in here from an earlier version that just got left in because uh, they weren't really important and they weren't adding or detracting from anything. So that'll be kind of interesting to sort through when you take a look at it. There's a game manager here that kind of oversees a bunch of things. It has explicit links to the castle objects. Um, it also has the point objects. And this is probably one of the hackier objects. It's a way to make things a bit easier, a bit faster for me to prototype on. Um, if I was going to expand this into a larger game, I might break this up into other scripts, depending on which, which way the game was going. Camera manager is keeping track of all those little camera hint setups that we talked about earlier, and it gives them little names. So you can send messages to enable and disable them. This is another thing that's just not used at all right now. Sound Manager has a bunch of sound effect clips attached to it. It actually uses an enumerated type, which is something that you can create yourself. You can set it to be whatever you want. It's basically a way of creating named uh, variable values. So, for example, I could be in on video games. Um, I could create Final Fantasy VI, and I could create Blood Omen, and I could create Puzzle Fighter. Max. And yeah, can't type fighter on this keyboard. 